turn to 730 in your hymnal, 730. Kevin, just pass out hymnals, raise your hand if you need a hymnal. 730? 730. What is it? What is the world to me? Oh, don't make that face. No, I don't need it. Oh, you don't need it? He knows the word. I thought it was a, oh, I don't like that one. I would never do that. Only John. Georg, Mikhail, Pepper. 7-3-0. Oh, thank you. All right, so this is uh, LSB 730 is next week's hymn of the day. Let's go ahead and sing uh, first and fourth. And Liz. Olivia is giving patience a ride home, so we don't have accompaniments uh, right now, unfortunately. <coughs> this is in the key of C major, beginning on the dominant fifth. <laughs> what is the world to me with all its haunted pleasure when you and you
So what the chronicler, or Ezra, is doing in chapter 8 is uh, providing a more extensive genealogy of the tribe of Benjamin. The meaning of the name Benjamin? Anybody know? A little bit of trivia? No, that's his brother, Ben-Oni. Yeah, son of, yeah, son of my so sorrow, or son of my turmoil. Um, that's uh, Benjamin's brother. Son of my right hand, Ben Yamin. Son of my right hand. You got a couple more? No? Sorry. All right. Um, and remember, Benjamin was the younger one. He was the, the younger brother that uh, when the older, when the uh, other sons of Joseph were coming down into Egypt because of the famine, and uh, Joseph was having a little bit of fun with them. Uh, and then he said, you know, uh, well, I can't remember, the, he wanted Benjamin to, to stay in Egypt. Anyways, Benjamin was the youngest after uh, Jacob thought that he lost Joseph, and so um, Jacob thought that he lost Benjamin. Anyways, Benjamin. Benjamin has an important, play, uh, important role to play, his descendants. Um, and so we pick up with the, uh, the genealogy of Saul here. Now, uh, if you can look at your notes, the emphasis upon uh, the importance of the tribe of Benjamin, at least for the writer of Chronicles, for his purpose, is to set up David. That's what we're doing. Because Saul came from the tribe of Benjamin, right? Now the tribe, and Benjamin, boy, they really, you know, a lot of Benjaminites got into some really, they did some dastardly things throughout Israel's history, but um, not all descendants of Benjamin are bad. Uh, obviously we have Saul's son, Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan was good. Uh, a friend of David. And then you also get, uh, who in the New Testament is of the tribe of Benjamin? <coughs> Paul, right? Another Saul. Another Saul who has the same change as Paul. He is also of the tribe of Benjamin. And he's listing his pedigree as Hebrew of Hebrews of the tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on the eighth day, right? I am Paul. Uh, but here we're setting the stage for David. Um, before we get to David, we've got to deal with Saul. Um, but there's not a whole lot of detail on Saul. Uh, if you look to your notes... Saul dies in disgrace, which we looked, we'll looked. we get to in the next chapter. Uh, but the descendants of his son Jonathan, Jonathan uh, will find favor with David. Um, Jonathan has a son named Mephibosheth. And you, if you remember going through the, the histories, um, going through Samuel, um, David has compassion on Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, and invites him to eat his, his table. Right? So he invites him into the royal, royal court because of his uh, devotion and dedication, because he and Jonathan had made a, um, a covenant with each other uh, to look after each other's offspring. And, so, um, and then other descendants of Benjamin play a, uh, an important role after the exile as well. So from Jonathan's line also uh, came men of valor, some of the Benjaminites joined forces with the sons of Judah to restore the kingdom to David's grandson, Rehoboam, Solomon's son. Uh, and then we learn in the first chapter of Ezra um, that the tribe of Benjamin remains important even after the exile. Okay, so all of this is to really get us to... Uh, we're making our way to, to Saul. We're really making our way to David. All right, so jumping into then into chapter 9... Um, Chronicle writes, so verse 1, So all Israel, Israel was recorded in genealogies, and these are written in the book of the kings of Israel. Does anybody have the Lutheran study Bible at no? all? At home. <laughs> what? Not a single hand? At home. <laughs> no, there's a... Of the many helpful charts, and your Bible may have it as well, 
Um, but one of the charts, or one of the kind of excurses provided in this study Bible is a list of reference works by the biblical writers you know, of other ancient documents that aren't in the Bible. Okay, so this is an example of this. Um, when Ezra, the chronicle, writes the book of the kings of Israel, he's not talking about the book of kings, per se, but another document called the books of the kings of Israel. And there's all sorts of, you know, you've got the writings of Gad the seer, and the writings of you know, Nathan the prophet, all these other writings that, um, that are lost to us that we don't have, that Ezra had access to and was using as he was writing uh, the book of Chronicles. Um, I don't know what you guys think of when you think of the writers being inspired by the Holy Spirit and writing Holy Scripture, but it's not as if you know they pull out their pen, or I guess with their quill, whatever they're writing with, and they just wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them in some sort of trance, you know, and they, they just start writing words on the page. You know. It's not like that. Um, they put their own thought into it. They put their own research into it. Uh, there's distinctive personalities uh, all throughout. But still inspired by the Spirit and governed by the Spirit. <clears throat> so, all of Israel is recorded in genealogies, and these are written in the Book of the Kings. Okay? Now, Ezra gives us the reason for the exile. And there you see it in bold type. Verse 1, Judah was taken into exile in Babylon because of their breach of faith. Right? They violated the covenant. They violated God's word. They stepped outside. Um, God had enough. Now in Chronicles, there is hope. And we mentioned last time that this is what, this is one of the main emphases in the writing of Chronicles is to instill hope and encouragement for these Israelites returning to Jerusalem from the Babylonian exile. Uh, they've got hope for the future. They've got hope, you know, that God is faithful to his promise to David, right? That the worship in the temple is going to be uh, it's reinstated. And if you recall... What's the very first name in the book of Chronicles? The very first word. Chapter 1, verse 1. Yeah. Very first word is a name. Adam. Adam, right? So, I mean, the point is, the chronicle is, in, is telling these returning tribes, look, you, this, is, this is purpose that goes all the way back to the beginning, Right? You are chosen of God. It goes back to Abraham, yes, but it goes back even farther than that. Right? God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for David, for his throne, for the monarchs. Okay? And <clears throat> all of this is going to be anchored in Israelites' loyalty to Yahweh and per proper worship of Yahweh. So the first to return to Jerusalem are people from the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, along with some priests, priests and Levites, and other, quote, temple workers. Uh, and you find this phrase a lot. You know, temple workers, temple workers. Well, who are these temple workers? Right? And are they distinct? Are they Levites? Are they priests? Are they distinct? They are distinct. They are not from the tribe of Levi. Uh, most likely... If you go back and you read Joshua chapter 9, the, the tribes have just crossed over the river Jordan, and they've just taken Jericho, and they've just taken Ai, or I. It's, the name of the town is the letter A and the letter I. It was up and I. And uh, the, this report is spreading throughout the land of Canaan. Canaan, oh no, here come the Israelites, right? Their God fights for them. Yikes. And so these people in the land of Gibeon decide that they're going to pretend to be, you know, all shabby. They, they're downhearted and downcast. And so they, they kind of trick the Israelites, Joshua and the other Israelites, into cutting a treaty with them. You know, don't kill us. We're just poor. 
look for our barbers, look at our shabby clothes, look at our torn wares, you know. And so the Israelites do, they cut a treaty. And then they find out, you know, oh, hey, this is a fast one. You're just trying to get us not to wipe you out. And then Joshua says, you know what? You're all going to be servants now. You're going to be woodcutters, you're going to be water carriers, and you're also going to be attendants in, at the altar of the Most High. We're attendants of the temple. So these temple workers are people from this um, line of, I don't know what we call it, disgraced Gibeonites. Um, more. So, <clears throat> anyways, we've got some important uh, tribal folks and uh, temple um, people coming back to Jerusalem. And then we got a listing of various groups. And one of the one of the guys listed is uh, one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament, this guy named Phineas, who was Aaron's grandson. And the chronicler writes in verse 20 of chapter 9, And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, was the chief officer over them in time past. The Lord was with him. Now he's listed within a group of people that are identified as the gatekeepers. They're the gatekeepers. Um, so you got, uh, oh gosh, some Levites, you know, sons of Korah, uh, and then you get all the way down to Phineas, son of Eleazar, he's Aaron's grandson, Lord of the Lord. Phineas has a, uh, he's got quite a story. <laughs> you familiar with Phineas? Yeah, Phineas. So what happens is, um, Numbers chapter 25, um, right after the business with, uh, with Balaam, prophet Balaam in Numbers. And um, the people come to a place called uh, Baal Peor. And some of the Israelites are taken into, you know, joining in with the worship of these people in, in Baal Peor. And um, the Lord is outraged that the people have gone a whoring as the Bible likes to put it, after other gods. And so, oh, come on, let's just jump there. Numbers 25. Let's take a little, a little excursus. Serious. 
Obviously he does. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family. In the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel, while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. When Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her belly. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Now Phineas was being obedient to what the Lord had told Moses, right? The Lord had told Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord. So this guy who brought back this Midianite woman isn't just some guy, right? He's a, he's, he's a chief among the people. We find that as we keep on reading. And the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. The name of the slain man of Israel who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Salu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the daughter of Zur, who was the tribal head of a father's house in Midian. So what sort of dangerous deal is being struck here with Zimri and Cosby? Well, you've got the leaders of two, you know, you've got two chiefs among these peoples coming together, and they're, right, and they're, they're family members marrying, and so you have this total blending now. Um, and the worship in Israel is going to be polluted by this, by the worship of the false god uh, of the people of Moab. And so Phine Phineas is... Uh, is praised for his action because he's jealous with the jealousy of the Lord. And then the Lord goes on to tell Moses, harass the many nights, strike them down. They have, they have harassed you with their wiles, with which they beguiled you in the matter of Peor and in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the chief of Midian, their sister who was killed on the day of the plague. So, we read back to First Chronicles. Uh, that Phineas is remembered in the chronicler because this is all part of his agenda. Part of this agenda is um, restoring proper worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem. Undefiled, unpolluted, people not going after other gods. So the chronicler wants us to say, ah, oh, remember that business with Phineas? Right. The Lord was with him. <clears throat> uh, and Phineas is listed with the gatekeepers. Right? So these were kind of, uh, I don't know what we would call the gatekeepers. Forerunners to the temple guard. You know, making sure that uh, things were going on inappropriately in the tabernacle and later on in the temple. <laughs> okay, and then at the end of chapter 9 we get a, a repeat of Saul's genealogy. Uh, we finally come to Saul in chapter 10, and um, it's rather brief. Uh, Saul's, in Chronicles, Saul's story starts and ends with his death. And that's all we get of Saul. Now Samuel gave us a lot more information about Saul. 
What do you remember about Saul from Samuel? What details about Saul? What about his appearance or his stature? Right, so he was handsome, right? He was well built, he was a head taller than everybody else. So he had all of these, you know, at least physical kingly attributes. Um, yeah, none of them, none of the stuff that we read about in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8 through 31, with Saul's, you know, beginning, his ascendance, and then his you know, descent, none of that is recorded in Chronicles. Saul, it seems, serves only the purpose <coughs> to be the wicked king um, who precedes David. The good king. So how does Ezra the chronicler regard Saul? What does he have to say about him? Well, verses, uh, chapter 10, verse 13. So Saul died for his breach of faith. Here we come across that, uh, that phrase again. Breach of faith. He broke faith with the Lord that he did not keep the command of the Lord and also consulted a medium seeking guidance. He did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David the son of Jesse. Saul consulted a medium? That's right. Who was she? The witch of Endor. Yeah, she was the witch of Endor. And uh, so what happened when he consulted her? There's a Samuel. Yeah. <laughs> right. Does that work? Samuel came back to life. Who disturbed my rest? Oh, it's me, Saul. I just want to know what I'm supposed to do. No, I don't think it's actual actually Samuel. I think this is this is demonic activity. This is not uh, Samuel. Somehow Saul pulls Samuel, you know, out of heaven, you know, back down to inhabit you know, his corpse to speak to uh, to speak to Saul. Um, how does? Wasn't the first thing he did was he started building altars? Yeah. In with the Yeah. So, uh, and that's some, that is something surprising. What Linda had mentioned was. Um, one of Saul's other mistakes was that he took it upon himself to uh, offer sacrifice. He was waiting for Samuel to come, and Samuel was the one who was authorized to do that. And Samuel and, and Saul goes, ah, where is that prophet? He's like, let's put out, offer the sacrifice, right? He takes it upon himself. And um, God is very particular when he gives rules for how things are supposed to be conducted in his house. For example, like how the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be transported. If you do that in a way that he has not authorized, there's judgment. He has authorized, you know, a certain type of fire, a burning of incense in his temple. If you bring unauthorized fire, like Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu who do, there's judgment, there's consequence for it. Um, and even David was praised um, in Chronicles to the point where, you know, all of the dastardly, shameful stuff that David had done that we read about in Samuel is not in Chronicles. Um, what we still have recorded is the business with Uzzah and the Ark. Um, really hammering the point home that the statutes concerning the worship of Yahweh, how he is to be uh, consulted, you know, are, a, are binding and they are abiding. Yeah, so that's the one of the other misdeeds of Saul is that he takes it upon himself to to offer to, to offer the sacrifice, uh, and Samuel lays into it for it. Um, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, so the chronicler, tell, the chronicler tells us that Saul uh, consulted a medium, and then he says he did not seek guidance from the Lord. Therefore, the Lord put him to death and turned. How is it? How does the faithful Israelite seek guidance from the Lord? How will faithful David 
seek guidance from the Lord. Yeah, but doesn't the first to kind of like Right. So you talk about Saul, right? Where is the Lord to be found in Israel? So in the tabernacle, or, yeah, the temple prior to the temple, the tabernacle. But there are places where God has authorized his name to be proclaimed. Right? So you get, as you go throughout, you find the patriarchs setting up altars, and those places become places where the name of the Lord is called. Okay? Um, with the construction of the tabernacle and the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, this is why it's so important for David to bring the Ark back. Because when David consults, going to be in connection with, with the ark, with the Lord's footstool, you know, where God's name is proclaimed, where it's blessing upon the people is proclaimed. Saul just does a bunch of bunch of stuff according to his own wisdom and, and what seems right in his own mind. Uh, and that's what we get about Saul. That's it. And now it's on to David. So at the end of chapter 10, you know, Saul, uh, Saul's put to death. Uh, the Philistines come and they strip him. Uh, they take his head and they put his head in the uh, in the uh, temple of their god Dagon. Um, but some of the faithful Israelites come and get Saul's body, uh, bury the body, and so forth. But now Saul's out of the way. And David had been king for about seven and a half years in Hebron. And now that Saul is dead, um, everybody's going to come together and acknowledge David as king. And then he will take up his residence in Jerusalem. <clears throat> so in chapter 11, David is anointed king. Um, he moves from Hebron to Jerusalem, which is originally called uh, Jebus. Uh, where we get the Jebusites. Uh, and it, on the way to Jerusalem, the Jebusites say, like, oh, you're not coming here. And David says, oh, yeah, yeah. And so he takes uh, takes control of uh, Jerusalem and takes control of the strong. Um, and there's so much... <laughs> yeah. So much is omitted from David's history. <clears throat> That's the purpose of this, uh, the purpose of the chronicle. And then we get a listing of David's mighty men. Um, I particularly like verse 12, um, where we find about find another Eleazar, the son of Dodo. So Dodo is not necessarily, you know, a bad name. Uh, just kind of a Ordinary name for an ancient Near Eastern man. <laughs> Trying to give a little foreshadow. <laughs> you never know. Go, we just advise. Go to a <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Yes. No. Yeah. Oh, boy. <clears throat> All right. So. Um, yeah, the listing of David's mighty men. It's interesting when you compare Chronicles with Samuel because the listing of David's mighty men, they, things, things are put in different order in Chronicles than they are in Samuel. And the listing of David's mighty men doesn't come until the very end of 2 Samuel. It's almost like an appendix. It's like an afterthought at, at the end of David's life. Oh yeah, here's a list of his mighty men. And it ends with Uriah the Hittite in 2 Samuel. Here in First Chronicles, we find Uriah the Hittite in verse what forty-one, and then a whole like fifteen or sixteen extra names. You know, so Chronicles is, is giving us a more exhaustive list. The genealogies are a bit more exhaustive. David's mighty men uh, is a bit more exhaustive. But 
Um, the fact that it's that the listing of David's mighty men is put so early on in the story of David um, serves the purpose of, uh, of highlighting uh, the importance of David, David coming to the throne um, and the taking of Jerusalem and so forth. Oh, I want to say anything else about chapter 11. Chapter 12. We get an account of the mighty men who joined David. Other mighty men. Now several of their contingents uh, join up with David um, as he's fleeing from Saul. And we've got four groups mentioned who defect. Um, groups from Benjamin and Gad and then from Benjamin and Judah, and then from Manasseh. So David has all of this, he's just acquiring uh, this, putting together this huge army. Um, which then continues after Saul's death. If you recall, after Saul died, David doesn't become the sole king of Israel. There's a contending Saul's son, uh, Ishbosheth. So did I say that right? Ish. Yes. Ish Ishbosheth. Um, he has a short, uh, ill-fated reign. And this is, you know, mainly the time that David is in the in the land of Hebron for these seven and a half years. Uh, and David's just continually receiving more men. Well, volunteers are, are signing up. And so at the end of this chapter, you've got David as the established commander of the national army of Israel. And there's people from all sorts of different tribes um, that make up this uh, army. And then a massive feast at David's coordination at the end of chapter 12. <clears throat> Uh, and so, as you read through this, you read just about, you just it's kind of staggering figures, how many tens of thousands um, of people David is uh, commanding. And then this description at the end of this, uh, of this party, <clears throat> beginning in, uh, in chapter 12, verse 38. All these men of war, arrayed in battle order, came to Hebron with full intent to make David king over all Israel. Likewise, all the rest of Israel were of a single mind to make David king. And they were there with David for three days, eating and drinking. For their brothers had made preparation for them. And also their relatives from as far as Issachar and Zebulun and Naphtali came bringing food on donkeys and on camels and on mules and on oxen. Abundant provisions of flour, cakes of figs, clusters of raisins and wine and oil oxen and sheep, for there was joy in Israel. <clears throat> now, something interesting happens when we get to chapters 13 and 14. Okay. Can I just mention one thing, one of my favorites? Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Of David in the water. <clears throat> oh, yeah, yeah. When they were encamped against the Philistines in battle with the Philistines, and the Philistines were in Bethlehem. And David and his mighty men were arrayed against him. And David just made the statement, and he said, Oh, that I had a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem. Apparently that well I had really good water. Three of his mighty men heard that. And they went and they fought their way through the Philistine line, got into Bethlehem to the well, drew a container of water from the well, fought their way back through the Philistines to David, and said, here, here's your water you want. And David, his comment was, far be it from me to drink this water for which these men have risked their lives. 
I am not worthy to drink it. And he poured it out on the ground as an offering to the Lord. There is a fantastic lesson of leadership. Yeah. I mean, it is a beautiful lesson of leadership. Right. Where, yeah. Yes. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think I heard once that that example was used in professional offices. Yeah. It's a testament to um, it's a testament to David, not only what he does after receiving the water, but the fact that he could make some an offhanded comment, right? Uh, I wish I had a drink from the water of Bethlehem. That he had already instilled such devotion. His men were so devoted to him that you know a careless word uttered by him. Such loyalty. Right. Would, uh, would cause them to go to, to such such lengths, you know, risking life and limb. Um, anybody watch the Band of Brothers uh, miniseries? What? Band of Brothers? Oh. I see that hand back there. <clears throat> yeah. Um, no, there's just... You get these... Uh, I don't know. I'm reminded, you know... There are heroic acts, you know, that, that inspire people to, you know, to do great things. I'm not going to try to explain what I'm thinking at this point. So, uh, no, thank you, Daryl. Read through, I mean, we don't have, you know, time. These are just short introductions to the books. But, you know, especially these chapters about David's mighty men, uh, it's pretty remarkable the feats that they accomplish uh, in battle, Right? So and so is the you know the chief wielder of the spear and kills three hundred guys, you know, or whatever, you know. And I think we got to think about these things. It's I don't think it's meant to be. We're meant to understand that this guy single-handedly killed three hundred people with a spear, but rather um, he led a group of people, you know, or he led a, a an attachment or detachment of soldiers, you know, which overcame this. Uh, great odds. But read through the mighty men, um, especially the first the first groups, you know, that talk about you've got the David's 30, and then of the 30, you've got, you know, three who are, uh, you know, in the top tier. Okay, so an interesting observation when we get to chapter 13 is that in Chronicles, I don't know if it has this heading in your Bible, but mine says the Ark brought from Kiriath Jearim. Okay? And then if you look um, to, if you flip over to chapter 14, maybe it's on the same page, down at the heading over verse 8, you see Philistines defeated. Okay? So, these two accounts in Samuel are reversed. You have the, the defeat of the Philistines listed before you have the ark being brought to Jerusalem. That's how Samuel reports it. Here in Chronicles, the ark is brought to Jerusalem, and then the Philistines are defeated. So, the question is, what's the purpose of reversing the order? Yes, I am. Bible study. Give me a call. Yeah. 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 Chronicles does is it the chronicler is 
establishes David. The importance of David, you know, as this figure in Israel's history, right? He's the king, he's the shepherd handpicked by God to lead his people. Uh, God gives him victory after victory over Saul. God is faithful to him. Um, David described, is described as what? A man after God's own heart, right? So this David um, is more than just a is more than a um, a man of valor. He's more than a mighty man. He's certainly the warrior king. But Chronicles also, even though it's not going to be given to David to construct the temple, Chronicles wants to show David's you know he's equally concerned about proper worship taking place in Jerusalem. Okay? That this was a goal for David. And this is the goal for the returning exiles. Right? Guys, why did we go to Babylon in the first place? A breach of faith. We were unfaithful to our husband. To our God. That's got to got to get that straight right off the bat. We were unfaithful. Okay? And this husband is bringing us back. Back to the land. Back to Jerusalem. To rebuild. To reestablish. We have got to get this right. So Chronicles presents a David, not only a man of valor, but who is also ultimately concerned with how worship is conducted uh, in the tabernacle later on in the temple. So much so that Chronicles contains all of this extra information with regard to David, you know, and worship. And so the whole episode of bringing the ark back to, to Jerusalem uh, is much more detailed in Chronicles than it is in Samuel. Um, so, the outline here says, David's concern for the Ark of the Covenant highlights the importance of the proper worship of Yahweh in Israel. Okay. Um, and here we see another, at the beginning of chapter 13, we see another uh, example of David's brilliance as a leader. Chapter 13, verse 1, David consulted with the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, with every leader. Okay? Wise. He's consulting with all the commanders. Right? The, 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 the lines of communication are open. Verse 2, And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you from the Lord our God, let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in all the lands of Israel, as well as to the priests and Levites, in the cities that have pasture lands, that they may be gathered to us. Then let us bring again the ark of our God to us. But we did not seek it in the days of Saul. All the assembly agreed to do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now David could have just said, right? He could have just issued a direct order, right? Go bring the ark back, right? I'm the king. You've got to do what I say. But he didn't. Right? He consults with these commanders, leaders of thousands out of hundreds, and of hundreds, so that it's the unanimous voice of the people. Right? They're all of one mind together. Yes. Let's bring this ark back. <clears throat> and then on the heels of this, um, we get the familiar account of Uzzah. And briefly, what happens to Uzzah? Now, this is kind of an odd story for me in Chronicles because Chronicles is kind of, you know, a retelling of history like that paints David in a really, really, uh, you know, in a good light. You don't get any of that David and Bathsheba stuff. Um, you don't get the son dying, the, you know, the baby. So I almost. To me, it's almost like, I uh, wonder why this story of Uzzah was kept in here. Should have just brought the ark back, right? Everything was fine. Uh, but I'm not the Holy Spirit, in case you didn't know. 
<laughs> and so the chronicler um, inspires Ezra, or the Holy Spirit inspires Ezra, um, to keep this in, in the retelling of the story. So they're bringing the ark back, but it's on a cart, a new cart. Okay, the oxen stumble, the ark's about to fall, and poor Uzzah. He's well-meaning, right? He wants to do the right thing. He doesn't want the ark to fall on the ground. So he just puts out his hand to stop it. But that's not how you're supposed to transport the ark. So poor Uzzah dies. And David is angry. David's afraid after this. And so there's this pause right here. He's not sure if he wants to continue bringing the ark to Jerusalem. So it stays with this guy named Obed-Edom, right? Obed-Edom, the, the Gittite, who has it for like three months or something like that. And, and what happens to Obed-Edom while the ark is at his place? Blessing upon blessing. Yeah, right? So I think David finally sees that, well, you know, Obed-Edom, he didn't die. Actually, he's being blessed, so let's finish the job. Let's bring the ark to the... Uh, Israel, or bring the ark to uh, back to Jerusalem. But we're getting ahead of, our, ahead of ourselves because chapter 13 ends with the ark remaining in the household of Oban Edo and the blessing that comes upon that for three months. And then we get this business, we get uh, uh, David's wives and children Daddy. again. Daddy. And at the start of 14, in, chapter, in verse 2, we read, And David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that his kingdom was highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. Okay? And there are three things in this chapter that confirm this. First, he receives aid from a foreign king, Hiram of Tyre, uh, for the building of his house, David's residence. Um... Right afterward, we read about David taking more wives in Jerusalem and fathering more sons and daughters, uh, including Solomon. And so somewhere in the middle, somewhere, somewhere in verse 4, you know, in the li these listing of four children, these are the names of the children born in Jerusalem, Shemua, Shobab, Nathan, and Solomon, is the whole episode with Bathsheba just passed over. Not part of the story. Okay. But the fact that there are more children being born to David um, is a sign of blessing. Children are always a blessing in the Bible. No one is ever cursed with children. They are always blessed with children. No, the only the sign of being cursed in the Bible is if your womb is closed. And you can't be That's cursed. <coughs> Psalm, Psalm uh, 127. Uh, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them, the children, you know. Um, like arrows in the hands of a warrior, you know, the children of one's youth. Crazy. And then we get a double defeat of the Philistines in chapter 14. Okay? A double defeat. So David knows. The Lord has established him as king over Israel. Uh, and twice he consults the Lord before going into battle with the Philistines. You know, and in both times God says, you know, yep, go out, go take him out. And then David's faith uh, spreads. Fear comes upon the other nations. And that takes us to the end of chapter 14. And I wanted to stop there because. Um, there's something of, I hope it's of interest to you, because it's of immense interest to me, the issue of, of singing during the sacrifices in the tabernacle. Because Chronicles records something, something new in this history of Israel, and that is, if you look back at how God has ordered the worship in the tabernacle 
with Moses, there is no command for any sort of uh, choral singing during the sacrifices. This comes with David. David, in wanting to establish a house for the Lord and worship properly, uh, if you flip over to, to chapter 16 and just look at it, uh, look at uh, the second heading down, David's Song of Thanks. This song is actually, it's a compilation of three song, three different psalms. And what David will do is, David is now going to establish this regular singing during the daily sacrifices in the temple. And of interest to me, uh, flashing you know, forward a few hundred years, there's a Lutheran commentator by the name of Abraham Kellogg who wrote a commentary on the Bible. And Johann Sebastian Bach had a copy of this commentary. And Bach wrote in the margin of his commentary at this section in Chronicles. Bach wrote a note saying, this is the foundation of choral singing in the divine service. Something like that. And so we jump, we get introduced to that um, starting with chapter 15 because we pick up with the story of the ark being brought out of the house of Obed-Edom into Jerusalem and David's song of thanks and the direction to these uh, musicians to play. You hear about you know Asaph. Asaph, you come across a lot in Psalms, right? Psalm of Asaph. Psalm of Asaph. Um, and here you encounter him in Chronicles. So beginning next Sunday, you know, um, we're going to look at this uh, uh, kind of oddity of singing during the sacrifices. The use of psalmody. Uh, during the sacrifices, which goes back to David. Now, this isn't, I'm not saying all singing goes back to David, right? Obviously, you have the Song of Miriam, you have the Song of Moses, you have the Song of Deborah. I mean, there are songs being sung before. But a legislated, ritualistic singing during the sacrifices um, is something that, that is attributed to David. So, anyways, that takes us right about to the end. So, Any questions or comments? I can't believe we're getting out on time. Join me in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory.